Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Contemporary Arts House 2020, the artist interview series. The series consists of short interviews between myself and the artists exhibiting in this show and is released twice a month, the duration of the exhibition. Joining us today is my Keisha Breeze, and behind me are the two works featured in the exhibition, Anonymous African-American Man and Child, 1856, and Anonymous African-American Woman in Basket, 1856. Thank you for being with us, Nikesha. Thank you. <laughs> so you were born near Portland, Oregon. You are a descendant of the Mende people of Sierra Leone and the Syrian American immigrants from Iran. And many of your works, including these two, there's a reuniting of past, present, and future peoples and stories. Um, so with that idea in mind, will you introduce us to the individuals that are in these two paintings? <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you for having me here. It's really great. Um, and to be in, and being in the show for one too. Um, these two figures are um, both from my archival portraiture series where I am taking old daguerreotypes um, and some amber types and tin types um, that were made in the United States between 1855 and um, 1863. So roughly the 10 years prior to um, emancipation and the Civil War. Um, this was when photography was developed. And so it's a really particular time, the rarity, the novelty of um, sitting for a photo uh, was mostly reserved for, for white folk um, across the globe. Um, black bodies in the United States and particularly enslaved bodies or bodies that were you know, um, dealing with what it meant to be a black person in this country at that time were rare in photos. And so there's a very small pool of these images that have been collected by the Library of Congress. And in my research, I fell in love with them. <laughs> I fell in love with these beings that were, were literally in stacks of anonymous images, you know, this small stack of rare photos of, um, of and so um, I decided that I wanted to paint them, um, that I wanted to uh, re enliven them. So each one of these figures are anonymous. I don't know anything about their story. I don't know their history. I don't know where they came from or why they were photographed or what they were doing or what happened to them after. And, and that's part of the, the intrigue for me too, is this place of the way that they are um, both historical and ahistorical because their actual story is, is missing in our narrative. And so that's part of what I'm doing in painting them is bringing them into our contemporary narrative, bringing their beings, their, the intensity in their gaze, the, the way that they are holding themselves in their space as um, a reflection into our contemporary story. Absolutely. So I think the scale of this work is part of that. I mean, these are 79 inches by 67 inches, they're, they're huge. Um, so you work in figurative art, you paint bodies, you paint real size bodies. And whenever I approach it, whenever a viewer approaches it, you become very aware of your own body um, next to that, that real scale figure. And I think it brings the story of the human, it brings the, um, that, that person closer to us and it brings our bodies closer to the history particularly of the traumatic experiences to black bodies in American history. Um, are you endeavoring to make that confrontation or that, um, that meeting happen? I, I am, and I love, I love that you point that out because it's such a, actually a really a subtle but yet incredibly important part of what I'm doing is by painting at human scale, um, I wouldn't necessarily say a confrontation, but it does make your body accountable to that body in a different way. When you know a body is shrunken in scale or enlarged in scale, there's a it seems to me a capacity for our as viewers for us to disconnect from it, to to not see it ourselves there. Um, you know, we can relate or we can imagine, but it's not instantly and, and in immediately implicated, like our bodies are not immediately implicated in our that mirroring recognition. And so I think that putting these black bodies, these anonymous and erased black bodies 
at human scale in front of our bodies makes us immediately uh, accountable or and implicated <laughs> in that exchange. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important. Um, I think about and when I see the works and I, and a lot of people who've seen them with me too will say the same thing. It doesn't feel like we are there to witness the paintings, but mm -hmm. more that the paintings are witnessing us, that we come actually kind of to, to be, be bore upon by them. Yeah. Um, so the, the intentionality of your actual process of creating these, the, the ritual, the repetitiveness are so meaningful in your work. At different times, I've read and listened to interviews by you where you talk about um, a certain number of layers you use in paint or this, this additive meditative process um, that actually builds up a narrative, it builds up a history and a mythology within the work. Can you talk about your process and your relationship to the materials in these two paintings? Yeah, um, I, I was talking recently with my partner about my partner Genevieve about this. Um, and she was saying, you know, what, what is it that you do? There's something specific in the layering and the the building and the stages that is, is so particular. And the word that came to me was that I, I like to incorporate stages um, of deference. And what I mean by that is that I, to be able to work with these, these real beings, working with these, what feels like real like spirits of our ancestors coming through, um, I, I have to get myself out of the way a lot as an as an artist as a black person as you know a contemporary being my own uh, my own mind my own uh, vision my own kind of cloudy like romanticizing of histories is is all there <laughs> and I need to move it aside and allow something more to come through and and I try to do that through the layering in the process of each piece so both of the pieces there behind you um, when you see them in person, you can really see the richness of what's happening on the, this texture and the surfacing. You know, all of the surfaces are weathered. Um, everything I work in and even the pieces you see behind me, the cracking. Um, I will do multiple layers of different paints and gessos and bases on those canvases, almost always starting with black, which is mm -hmm. symbolic to me too, is that every canvas I start actually begins in black instead of white. And then I build the whites on top, but they, I leave them outside. <laughs> I leave them in the weather, literally. I allow the rain or the sun or the snow at certain times to actually have a layer of effect on the clay, on the paints. And so whatever happens from that process then is my next stage. Then it actually informs what figure comes on. I don't know what figures I'm going to paint or what images will come until actually I've, I've seen what the, the sky does to it. <laughs> and then I say, oh, okay, there's, this is a feeling that is coming through that feels like this other being that I encountered either in this photo or you know, in my mind and I'll know what figure goes on. And then I'll start that. And then that relationship between that figure and the background is something sort of beyond me. You know, in the piece behind me here, there was this huge hole <laughs> that happened from the actual paint peeling off because of one of the, the weathering and it happened to be right in the center of her body, you know. And so these types of relationships are, again, not me. And I, and I like that. <laughs> it creates a layer of richness, you know, and then each, each piece gets built up, you know, through layers of paint, through simple washes, and then through thicker layers of paint with the, the actual figures. Um, the frames are also sculpted. Um, those pieces, you know, are um, kind of ritualized with death masks and the four corners. Um, or actually the centers that hold this, the prayer of their, their honoring all together. So every single piece matters in the paintings from the very first time it comes, you know, the black canvas, <laughs> the, the black beginning, you know, all the way to the final framing. It, each time I try to build a stage in where I step aside and let something else happen. I love that sort of um, your ability to kind of let go and, and let sort of chance take its its, um, its place. 
you taught yourself how to build the frames for this exhibition, didn't you? I did. Yeah, it was, it's always been a dream of mine to be able to make the full frame, like the, the full image of how I wanted them held. And so this was the first time that I, I actually completed and built the frame. So I did, I taught myself how they're all cold cast bronze, um, hand sculpted frames. And then um, I had some support from a dear friend of mine, Kent Kobakoff, who helped um, with the installation as well as helping me mill and create the outer walnut frames. Um, you know, all of it is, you know, just incredible. It was incredible. It was a wonderful process artistically. So I met you, you applied for the open call. We met on Zoom. We did the interview like all the other artists, but I actually met you in person. Not, I didn't even meet you. I saw you in person um, during the protest that took place near Taos Plaza after the, the death of George Floyd um, in which you were on stilts. You were speaking through a megaphone and you led hundreds of people through a lay-in in the middle of that busy intersection and talked us through the eight minutes of um, what George Floyd experienced whenever the cop's knee was upon his neck and it was so powerful. It was, um, yeah, it was truly an incredible experience to be part of, but you, you're a social activist. That was part of your life. Um, and I wanted to ask you how you feel about this, this moment in time right now. Do you feel like we're living through a unique period in time right now where we're more aware of injustices that are happening um, towards persons of color? Do you think that we're um, more aware of what's happening with systematic racism? Um, do, you, do you think this time is unique? Hmm. Um, every time is unique in that, <laughs> you know, they are every, we have so many different layers of, of what's happening, like with recognition and atrocity. Um, and they play back and forth, you know, especially, you know, with racism. I've talked about this before in the past, you know, how, um, you know, racism has really gone lock and like lockstep with our progress, like our pro anti-racism, <laughs> you know, the, the, the more things change, the better, the more recognition, the more accountable, the more, you know, eyes are on, you know, what's happening, the more covert the more underground, the, the more entrenched, you know, other racist patterns, you know, seem to embed. And so there's always, um, there's it's every single time and really being somebody who studies history so assiduously, you know, to as the foundation of my work, you know, I, there's so many times in our history where it has been and has continued to be really incredibly devastating for black and indigenous people. I mean, we have been in a, in a long history of, of pain and suffering and genocide. And, um, and, and that's still happening right now. I mean, in this contemporary time, it is all still happening. It's all still happening in, in every way, you know, and, and we are, maybe people, some people are, are waking up to it um, in this time. I think that's, that is true. And then there's a lot of people who've been awake to it for a long time, the whole time that have been fighting and yelling and screaming in the streets and, you know, protesting every single day, you know, for this and have never, they, they, there's, this is definitely not a wake up call. It's a, hey, I'm glad you all have woken up. We've been screaming the house is on fire for a long time. Thank you for waking up. You know, so I think that there's, there's definitely some of that. Um, so it is, it is maybe unique maybe it is unique. I, COVID definitely makes it very unique for our, our little period of history. The combination of all of these things at the same time is really unique. Um, and the, the uprising of civil rights across the, you know, for civil rights, for Black and Indigenous bodies, for anti-racism across the world, you know, that has been incredibly inspiring. It really is and was, you know, when the George Floyd protests began the, the largest and still people are still protesting, um, you know, but it is still the largest protest, you know, for civil rights in our lived history. And, and so that's particular and important, you know, and I, I think that there is a chance for real changes to begin and, um, you know, and, and massive and, and like very important radical changes can happen right now that could be incredibly essential 
for all of us. And I think that that's exciting that we can actually start to make some bigger steps of progress. Um, and, and perhaps we can start to dismantle some of these larger and deeply ingrained systems that have continued oppression. Absolutely. Um, and I think museums are, are part of that. We're one of those systems and museums really haven't gotten, you know, museums have gotten called out in this movement um, through the Change the Museum movement, through several very brave staffs that have stood up um, in the face of, of racism in their system. Um, you know, I think it's really, it's important that your work is in the museum right now in this royal tradition at this scale. You know, we placed it slightly higher than all of the other works. So they really were positioned as king and queen or some sort of, you know, royalty, um, you know, in the same style that European halls would place the royal couple at, at the sort of height of the walls to look down on everyone. Um, you were actually the first African-American artist to be shown at the Harwood Museum, which is significant. That was in 2018 uh, with the curator, Matt Thomas. Um, you know, I've read and listened to a lot of things you've said about uh, the body as a site of decolonizing and a site of healing. I wonder if there's a bridge um, that we can make or a conversation to have about uh, what museums could learn as, as a place of decolonizing, as a place of um, healing, as a place of coming together. Um, you know, is there anything that you, that you would like to say about, about how museums could learn from that? Mm -hmm. I love that question and, um, and just the, the whole thinking around it because it's so true and so important. Um, when we talk about decolonizing the body, you know, that's that word itself is thick with so much, you know, and particularly, you know, within indigenous communication and, and then now it's been really broadened out to this larger scale understanding of colonization. Um, what at its root, I think I'm talking about, you know, when I talk about decolonizing and how I relate it to the museum is that, you know, we have to, we have to see how, um, there's there's such a long history of sh of shifting the narratives towards these eurocentric you know visions these eurocentric uh, value systems these eurocentric ideas of what is aesthetic what is beauty what is art i mean in the museum world that's like a big deal and that you know that piece has to shift radically like we have decolonizing means like we're literally having to take out these ideas that are that are non-indigenous to the body, like to or to the to the being, to the um, I'm going between museum body and <laughs> the social body. <laughs> Let me come back to like the one thing. Um, this is visual. Again, I'm an artist, so my mind thinks visually. You know, I feel like when I'm talking about colonization, we're talking about the way that the the body has been invaded. This the land, indigenous land has been invaded, <laughs> has been, you know, truly. And that invasion goes through every single system of, of the, the land. So colonization has come through every single system of what a museum even is and why it is and how it's built and what it's doing. All of that is narrated by this invaded system. Like, we're, we're, if we're talking about cherishing art, you know, like what, you know, what is that really when we're actually stealing art from indigenous people or from people across the world, when we are taking it, you know, out of its, of its place of origin, you know, or when we are showing in contemporary museums, you know, you know, art that is, is really focused on a Eurocentric narrative. Like, I don't know, there's so much inside that, um, that, you have to change everything. <laughs> Museums have to, and we do as our bodies have to change everything. In our physical bodies, we have to also look and see like how our standards of our own sense of beauty, our own sense of being is dictated by colonized ideas, our own sense of relationships, our own sense of how we, you know, relate both to our family and to each other and to our, our sense of self. All of these ideas, you know, um, often are put into us rather than emerging out of our, our own, you know, original essence and understanding of truth. Like, so, so decolonizing is about returning to like 
this place of um, origination. Mm -hmm. And um, and on one level, you know, and then there's all these different, there's so many different political and social levels of what decolonizing looks like when we begin talking about decolonizing education, you know, and, and widening the narratives that are actually taught, realizing that, like, you know, we need to teach all histories and not just, you know, Eurocentric histories and then have a chapter on African histories or a chapter on, you know, all the other world histories. histories yeah, which you know, like we need to decolonize, we need to take, we need to take these narratives that are being put in and blast them out. So the, the museums need to be filled with art from artists from so many parts of the world with all of their ideas that are absolutely incredibly essential and unique. They need to be seen. If museums are about cherishing art and artists and perpetuating, you know, important ideas and important shifts in consciousness through art, you know, or experience through art that needs to be ha had from a global voice, every museum, and it needs to be down to the way that it's curated, the staffing, the administration, the structure, the way things are shown, the way things are experienced physically in space, the accessibility. I mean, it all has to has to be sh shifted radically. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> Sorry. No, I know. It's exactly. It's, we all need to hear. It's great. It's a lot of things. <laughs> My to-do list is very long. So. It is. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's <very good. laughs> so last question. It's a question we've asked every artist as part of the show. Uh, the exhibition was limited to arts uh, or to artists who are from Taos or who have deep roots in Taos. What is your connection to this place? Ooh, um, I love Taos. I, you know, I, I moved here as a young, a young one, you know, I was 19. I think so, you know, I've been here 21 years. Um, I, I came here with basically nothing but a bike and a backpack and fell in love with this land. Um, I had found out about Taos when I was a young girl and I was eight years old. Um, I was really interested in Taoism and the Tao. And I saw the name Taos on a map and I said, oh my gosh, it's the land of the Tao. I need to live there. <laughs> and so I, I, was, I was enamored with it. And then I forgot about that. And then I ended up just showing up in Taos and I uh, was moved so deeply by the land, by the people, by the feeling of the air, by the light, you know, all the things that people fall in love with this place for. Um, and so I, I made it my home. Um, about 10 years ago, I, um, in deep, deepening my study of my history, um, I found that my family actually is from New Mexico, um, originally from the 1800s. Wow. We were some of the first founders um, in Southern New Mexico, in, in Blackdom, New Mexico, outside of Roswell, um, like 1890s, my family <laughs> moved here and founded a town. Um, and so at yeah, and so that's been an incredible thing to know that I'm actually, you know, have some sense of roots and they, they had come through Texas and, um, you know, and there's all the different stories of the, the width of that history, but um, they came through Texas and then originally, you know, from slave plantations in North Carolina. So, you know, the long Western migration, you know, ended up with my family coming to New Mexico and then eventually, you know, branching off to Oregon, where I'm from, to Portland, um, where I was born those generations later. And so for me to complete the circle and to show up in New Mexico as a young person, you know, just trying to figure out where I belonged in the world uh, was pretty, pretty special to, to find that out, to connect back and realize that I really am supposed to be here. <laughs> That's perfect. A perfect way to end. Thank you so much, Nikisha, for being here with us and for being a part of this exhibition. Um, and thank you all for joining us on Facebook Live. We'll be back next time on December 16th with an interview with J. Matthew Thomas. Thank you. Thank you.